Thank you. And I was able to go ahead and let them ask them. So excuse me for you all folks who can hear a little bit better. Thank you all for wearing this. I appreciate that. Uh, before uh, we jump into kind of what we do, a lot of times with presentations like this, we like to give a little bit of a primer on the cross history. We don't make any assumptions that you all know anything about the cross history. So if you do know a lot about the cross history, hopefully you still enjoy the photos as we go. But this is this might be uh, old hat for you guys, but it won't take long. I just want to give a nice primer of the cross history before we talk about anything else. So the story of the cross begins with geology. Uh, the area was never covered by glaciers during the Ice Age. Meltwater carved out the valley to the bluffs. In the cross, where the Mississippi Black and the Cross Rivers meet, created a wide floodplain on which the cross now sits. The city of the cross occupies prairie land that was once home to a band of Hocha. The Hocha gathered here to trade and socialize. They also played a game we now call the cross, which is why the city where the name of the city comes from. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed a new rule act in an attempt to forcibly and often violently remove indigenous folks from their ancestral lands located east of the Mississippi River to occupied territories west of the river. Throughout the 1830s and 1840s, the federal government conducted a series of attempts to forcibly remove local culture by steamboat via the Mississippi River to reservations in Iowa, northern Minnesota, and South Dakota, and then finally out to Nebraska. The historic steamboat landing where this took place is now Spence Park in downtown La Crosse, uh, which is which bus right up against the river side it's a very small area it's got its own plaque at the front of state street if you've never noticed before take a look at that uh, however many of the process of have found their way back to the to the area recent figures show wisconsin is home to over 8,000 members of the whole nation over 200 of which live in the cross county the origins of the permanent white settlement in the cross began with the arrival of fur trade nathan myrick in 1841. myrick and his partner traded with the whole peoples La Crosse relied heavily upon water and transportation for its contact with others. The earliest road to the village was originally a Native American trail from the Prairie Sheep along the Mississippi River. Slowly, the town site grew from a handful of houses in 1850 to an astonishing population of 745 just three years later. By 1855, the Cross had grown to a population of over 1,600. In 1856, the Cross officially became a city. North of the Cross remained a separate village until 1871, when it was annexed into the city under what some of side residents considered a house to take over at that time. And you can see here, this is the road, this is where Colton and Rose Street would be. This is just an 1867 artist rendering, not a picture, obviously, but it's pretty accurate to what was there. This road right here is what is Colton and Rose now, north of the Cross, so over in this general region up here. And now it's you know, merged together very nicely over the last time of four years. By 1858, uh, the cross was connected to broad railroad networks to the east. The Mississippi was a major way to move people in Minnesota across cross to become a hub for railroad to connect to the water traffic. By 1886, six major rail lines came into the cross, and in the meantime, a railroad bridge had been built across the Mississippi, meaning the cross was no longer the end of the line in this part of the country, but was a gateway to the west. And we have some Great photos of rail workers and early railroads in the cross up in our collection. Lumbering became the first major industry to affect settlement in the cross, as lumber from up north was being sent down the Black and the Cross Rivers. By the early 1850s, there was as many as 11 sawmills on the Black Harbor in the area, a couple of which are featured here. One of these is south of downtown. This is what they would have looked like uh, up on the Black River area. Since those Mississippi River roads could not navigate, uh, the black and small black river. Car boats and supplies were unloaded at the cross. Merchants of the cross became the middlemen uh, of those supplies, sorting for new goods for commission. While well, others bought supplies uh, from town south of the cross and resold them to lumbermen. Other industries such as shipbuilding and repairing thrived here as a direct result. A few trivia questions for you here, and I'll read it out and you can think about it if you want to shout out what happened. North of the Cross, established as a prominent lumber industry on the Black River, was annexed into the city of La Crosse in 1871. What ethnicity was the dominant group in North of the Cross who worked in the pioneers and lumber mills? Was it Norwegians, Germans, Dutch, or Bohemians? German. This is North of the Cross. Germans? Can that your guess? Norwegians. North of the Cross was mostly established with Norwegians. The area we're sitting now, city of La Cross, was mostly was in other Germans, but North of the Cross was Norwegians. 
They established our crops at Walmart Camp, working class, uh, type of vibe, with a railroad landscape through our crops in 1885. The area grew considerably in size as a result of being the site of much of the rail industry activity in the late early 20th century. You can see a lot of that framework for the railroad still active today in North La Crosse in the industrial park and other areas in North La Crosse that still has active rail. Whereas when you get down here towards the town, active rail is gone. What was active rail is not gone. Lumber in the field of La Crosse area county. It was not uncommon for new immigrants to arrive in La Crosse and then go to work for one of the large lumber mills. Eventually earning enough money to buy some property or farm. It was dangerous, long, and hard work, and the newspapers were full of accounts of accidents. Many regulators uh, became rich from the seemingly endless supply of pine, uh, but when the Wisconsin supply ran out near the end of the 19th century, these lumber barons that owned the companies, not the workers we're talking about, but that owned the companies, uh, they moved further west or south uh, to pursue lumbering as a source of capital, leaving behind some of the mansions we recognize as historic landmarks today. At the turn of the 20th century, when the lumber industry faded, other industries started up. Farming and manufacturing became the major drivers of La Crosse economy here. Such companies as the La Crosse Ball Company, which became Alice Chalmers, the Pearl Button Industry, uh, rubber boots and shoes at the La Crosse Rubber Mills, which is featured on the far right photo there. Beer production, these things all came to be in the early 20th century after the lumber industry died. The train company uh, grew from a very small holding outfit. In the late 19th century, we just had a small office downtown. Uh, it became a national industry starting in the early 20th century as well. And obviously, still thrives and succeeds to this day here at Cross. As more and more people began living here because of all these industries, service businesses started becoming a larger part of the development of Cross. Grocery stores, hotels, restaurants, barbers, hospitals, the universities. When Western Technical College, uh, what became of Western Technical College, the Turbo University, UW La Crosse, all of these had their roots in this time period in the early 20th century. Prohibition squashed many La Crosse breweries, uh, while some of them were able to make malt and soda beverages uh, to survive the new years. We give a nice example of this in our city records. Uh, when Prohibition starts the year before, we have three or four pages worth of taverns in the yellow, like what's considered the yellow pages of the city records. The next year, it's all, it cuts in half, first of all, the number of places that would have been considered that, and then it just goes to soda or beverages in the yellow pages because they can't be selling alcohol anymore. Uh, and so you can see a really distinct line when Prohibition happens, obviously, how it affects all the businesses here. Uh, the G. Highland Brewery Company was one of the only survivors of the cross by the, by the 1930s, whereas there were eight breweries operating simultaneously in 1900. Highland's legacy and physical plant live on the cross as city brewery. A little tricky question here. In 1872, Captain Highland bought off his brewing partner and eventually renamed his brewery the G. Highland Brewery Company. He died in 1878. His wife continued the brewing operations. What was her name? You hear Johanna over there? Anybody else have another thought? Okay. Johanna is correct. She's recognized as one of the first, if not the first, female CEO of all those kinds of business. Under her leadership, decision making was shared by the corporate board of directors, a modern style of business management that was instrumental in the growth of the company. The company managed to weather the prohibition years, and after World War II, we were to be one of the biggest breweries in the country by the late 20th century. So not only did it survive prohibition, but it actually came out of prohibition and thriving for the next 40, 50 years. And it was very much due to her leadership. During the 1950s and 1960s, several of large manufacturing industries were shut down. This included Alice Chalmers, formerly known as the Cross Club Company. This is Third Street. These buildings are gone north of the Third Street on downtown, uh, where the Cross Community used to be where a new hotel was built six, seven years ago, near the corner of La Crosse Street and Third Street. So in fact, if I can do this, this right here, it's a, a camera wall kind of taken was, but the footing of that's still there by the GECU bank. If anybody's been in the GECU parking lot, there's actually a big circular footing, and it's this thing right here. So check that out if you want to drive by today. Um, Northern Agreed Manufacturing, we got it on in 1961. If I didn't say it, Alice Chalmers shut down in 1959, and then Electric Auto Line is another major industry that shut down in 1969. 
All of these things that change the industry yes. You get that back. What's that? Elves first, then elves travel. But my dad is still working in elves travel in the 60s. Okay. Okay. The old things, those changes in the industry, the, the shutting down the major industry, along with the major flood of the Mississippi River in 1965, affected lacrosse in many ways. Uh, North Lacrosse and downtown area were hit particularly hard. All of these factors helped push the funding for Harbor Beam Plaza, which is an urban delay project funded by the federal government. Uh, that area, so the U.S. Bank Building, Radisson, Lacrosse Center, that's all considered part of Harbor View and then outreach of Harbor View. So some of those things started with Harbor View and then it expanded a little bit beyond the Harbor View project. But that area is kind of what we're talking about here. Six and a half blocks of front street buildings. Some of the oldest in the city were demolished to clean up the riverfront in the area that is now the showpiece for Riverside Park. So some of them would have been condemned based on the flooding, some of them was just because they wanted to clear the whole area. So what you see here in this picture from about 1900, all of this is gone. The buildings on the left side of the photo would have been south of Front Street. So now there's no more historic buildings on the south side of Front Street at all. You have LHI, you have uh, Lacrosse Community Theater, that area would have been all historic buildings prior to the Harbor View Plaza project coming through kind of wiping them all. Um, so this area is the foot of State Street. Spence Park right here, we talked about the riverboat landing before. River, uh, Riverside Park was built out of river dredge, so it actually extended out into the Mississippi River, so this is prior to all of that. So this is getting to the south side, of, or the west side of French Street buildings here. The bridge you see there is gone as well. Uh, that would have come into downtown what was called Mount Vernon Street at the time. Mount Vernon Street no longer exists. Basically, it's under the lacrosse center. It was about a block and a half of, of street at the end of that bridge that ended at Front Street. And it would be between Pearl and J Street now, where the lacrosse center sits. So Mount Vernon Street is gone. That's where that bridge would come into downtown. So another trivia question here. The Van Shell Riverside Park was a gift to the city. Of the Ross and memorialize which former mayor? E. Campbell, Thomas Stoddard, John Levy, or Wendell Anderson? Wendell Anderson. Mayor Anderson on both sides. You are correct. Dr. Wendell Anderson was credited with through the cross around and after the economic demise saw the crash in the lumber industry. He is credited for the founding of the park system. The, what you see over there is an image from Bob Armand's original bench shop design and was originally intended for public lectures and meetings, but as you know, over the 100 years plus, used for many of the things, uh, including moon tunes, uh, other music throughout the summer, with a wonderful camping out over it as well. It was just put up a couple years ago. So the cross began to refocus on the historic preservation of the downtown area after Harborview and the loss of several other major public buildings. The library was set up the site before this building was built. The courthouse, city hall, finally the post office, all of those are historic buildings that we have lots of photos of that no longer exist. Uh, so the loss of those buildings, the loss of some other homes, such as the Cargill home on um, West and Camp Street, the Cargill Mansion, for that matter, uh, really turned people's minds around about historic preservation. Since then, historic preservation has been a big part of the process of development, and particularly in downtown. Many buildings have been saved, historically renovated, and reused for new businesses, restaurants, and offices. The building on the left there is the Pop building. So this is Second Street. And then you have Main Street running this way. That building is still there, obviously. State Bank building on the right. This is what was North Lakers. It's now the Blue Trading Company. That building still is there to do uh, the Trading Company put several million dollars into the historic renovation. That building for its use in, in the uh, uh, lower level there as well. Now the cross is seen as a great example of what can be done with old buildings by making them exciting part of the city. In the last uh, 20, 25 years, the cross has become a place where new types of businesses and industries called homes, such as healthcare, and hospitals, software companies, heating and air conditioning companies, and environmental scientists, or sciences, excuse me. The cross continues to grow and thrive. One well, last year question. The first ever high school building in the cross high school was built on Main Street, which is right up here. At what cross street? 4th Street, 8th Street, West Avenue, or Lozzi? 
which is eight streets over here. You are correct, we're right across the street. So right there. In fact, it stood until 1907, when it was raised to make way for Washington School, the elementary school. That was torn down in 1984, and the Washington Apartments stand there. Wow. Anybody live in the Washington Apartments? Okay. All right, I'm going to hand it off to you, Jenny. Thank you for indulging the history lesson. Us identifying a collection of 
us identifying primary sources that exist in the community that could come to the archives for preservation, right? So collect. So we went, we, we had a meeting, we, we went to the American Legion Post, and this is a picture of one of the rooms here. Um, and yeah, they let us basically keep all of the materials. They had over 100 years worth of records from the American Legion Post. And here are mostly scrapbooks. This vinyl cabinet back here had membership cards dating back to the 1880s. Um, and they wanted this room cleared so that they could have it back for storage. Just out of shot here, about here in the room, um, <laughs> there was a giant trash can that there was a, so the bar for the American Legion was right upstairs and they had a chute from the bar where they throw the beer cans down the chute for it to land in this trash can. So in the same room as 130 year old records were beer cans splattering around, right? It's not a great environment for old records. Um, so they were thankful to get them off their hands. They needed that room for storage. Um, and we have room for, uh, you know, we have climate control, we have the, the knowledge for historic preservation, um, and then we allow people Right, so it's just a, a win-win situation for both of our institutions. Um, so this is two pictures of me and staff um, physically picking up the materials and putting them in a library van and bringing them back to the library. Right, so that is also collecting. A lot of times, that's not what collecting looks like. Typically, people um, are you know cleaning up their attic or their parents' house or something, and they find a trunk or a box full of things, and they call us and ask us if we want them. That's typically what collecting looks like. Um, but collecting looks like all sorts of things. And sometimes it's an institution getting rid of their records. And um, we typically help out with the transportation of that since it's so many records. So next, organize and preserve. Got a part of my story. So um, we were going through one of the rooms, and um, I was becoming disappointed. I didn't think I was going to find, find Corey's letters. Um, and we were about to leave, and I remember there was a, there was a table um, with a little small wooden box on it with folded up pieces of paper inside. And I think it was like right below the light switch or something. So I was about to turn off the lights on the other way up, and I saw this box. Um, and I just picked up the top piece of paper, thinking, these are old pieces of paper, I don't know what this is. Um, and right there, I had Roy Baker's name signed in person, and I realized that box was the letters. They had just been sitting in the old cigar box that his mom probably gave to the American Legion Post way back when, full of his letters. And then there were some photographs of him, like the one that my first time I showed you. Um, and like his high school report card, just a few random things that his mom had given the American Legion Post. Um, so I got super excited, right? The letters, they exist. Um, so the next part, organize and preserve, going back to the archives. There were about 60 pages of letters. Um, and they were all out of order. So what I had to do was start reading through them to put them in order, right? Uh, and that's pretty easy to do because Roy used different stationery and different kinds of ink. Sometimes he used pencils, sometimes he used a pen that was a little brown, sometimes it was a little black. Um, and then the stationery was a little different, so it was easy to kind of figure out which pieces of paper were the same letter and how to put them in order. Um, and then he numbered his pages, which is always very helpful. Um, and from there, I was it was pretty easy for me to get them in order. Not all the letters are uh, complete. Maybe his mom lost some pages, maybe she purposely didn't let certain pages go <coughs> to the American Legion Post. Um, but for the most part, what we have for these letters is uh, the story of Roy leaving the cross, going down to Waco, Texas, where he trained for six months, um, and then riding a train from Waco, Texas to New Jersey, where he got on a ship and went to France. Um, I think he was in France for about three months before he died, and that whole time he sent letters to his mom. There's some interesting things in these letters. Um, for instance, he had nine of her siblings. He's the older, oldest of 10 kids, um, and he was a working class family. His dad couldn't work. He was really one of the main breadwinners of the family. This is just a 20-year-old kid. Um, and so he's always asking his mom, how's dad? Is dad doing okay? Is he, is he keeping his job. Um, how are my brothers? How's my sister? I hear you gave my brother my suit. That's not very nice because I'm going to come back home and I'm going to need my suit jacket. Um, he was just constantly saying, just constantly asking about his younger siblings, and it's very cute. Um, he, um, 
so so while he's while he's going from Waco to New Jersey, a few people on the train that he's on die from the influenza. Um, and at the time when I read this in 2018, um, that like that didn't really strike as a super important thing. But now as we're living through a pandemic, um, having fine resources talking about the last pandemic is very meaningful, right? Um, we don't have a lot of things from the 1918 pandemic. Uh, oh yeah, those are the photographs that were in the box too. Um, so me taking these pieces of paper and putting them in order, and then I put them in plastic, acid-free sleeves, and they're now in acid-free folders in a box on a shelf in a kind of climate-controlled room where they are protected for future generations to use, right? Um, Anita, oh, I'm gonna skip this, sorry. Anita got the job of all of the rest of the records. Um, so she is going through all of these moldy records to um, get them in order, and I mean, some of them have to be thrown out because they're so moldy from that new room. Um, but this has been a long process of her going through these records. You'll see some suitcases. That's because every single president of the, um, not every single one, but most of the presidents of the American Legion would leave their personal papers to the American Legion in a suitcase before they left. So like, that's the personal papers of, of an acting president. Um, but I think we're pulling three or four of those suitcases. Um, so then we wanted to publicize this, right? This was all happening at the 100th anniversary of World War I ending. And so we wanted people to know that this was happening. So Nia was taking pictures on um, this whole process and putting Facebook posts up and talking about it, right? Uh, that's us telling people, that's us telling the world that, that these records now exist at the archives for them to come and use. Um, we also have a blog in the archives where we, we publish um, new content every other week. So I wrote a blog post about Roy Bakers, um, and this here is a, a photograph of his funeral procession. We also have a weekly column in the Tribune um, called The Way It Was, which maybe some of you read. Um, so I put that photograph in The Way It Was to commemorate his um, funeral. Uh, then I also made an exhibit. Um, we had a speaker that week who was talking about uh, the he was talking about World War One um, and some of the scouts and research that he had done. So I had an exhibit down at that program. We also had an exhibit at the Weber Center for a little bit, um, just kind of talking about these letters and why they matter. Um, so provide public access. This is arguably probably the most important thing we do as archivists. Uh, the main reason, or sorry, the main way that we provide public access. So we have these materials sitting upstairs in our vault, right, in boxes. Um, and they're organized. We have folders that are labeled in boxes that are labeled. Some of you may have used these things before. Um, but to help researchers use those materials, we create a thing called a find key. I know this is really small, you can barely see this, but what we do, if, if you think about how you order a book from the library, right, you're searching a catalog record. And that catalog record, when you go to order a book, will tell you the author, it'll tell you the year it was published, it'll tell you the summary of the book, right? A fine name does a very similar thing, but for a large collection. So it'll tell you who created the materials. It'll tell you a small abstract of the materials and why they matter in an article of history. Um, it'll tell you the extent of the collection, which means like if it's half a box or if it's 30 boxes. So that matters as a researcher. You have to know how many materials you're going to be looking at, right? Um, and the other thing that fine name does is it has a box list. Um, so every single folder and every single box um, will be labeled and it'll tell you what kind of materials are in each folder box. So you know, like, oh, I want box five, folder seven through nine when I'm coming to research today because those are the financial materials that I care about looking at. Um, and on our website, we have all of our findings available to view. So even though a lot of our materials can't be digitized because we don't have the resources, um, the finding is online. Um, and that's where you can search for the materials you want to be researching. Uh, the second part of our mission statement is, is the broad part, less specific. Um, so I'm just going to quickly kind of run through some of the materials we have for people who may come to visit the archives. Um, we, have, we have so many things. We have photographs, we have maps, we have genealogy resources. There's many genealogy resources that are available online um, that are, you know, about Europe and general U.S. resources, but we have stuff that's specific to the cross. 
Um, we have a manuscript collections, which the Roy Bakers and the uh, American Ninja Post, Post Records are considered manuscript collections. We have the city records. Um, and then we've been clipping newspaper files since the 1970s. Um, and that's one of our most used resources, really. Um, this is our reading room here. Um, this is where there's a lot of genealogy resources on the wall. Um, the vault is back through this door. And so when you come in and you say, I want to look at a certain collection, um, we would come and pull that up for you and bring it up to the reading room for you to view. This is the vault here. So this is where the clipping files are. And then um, this goes all the way down towards the reference area. Um, and we utilize about um, maybe 70% of that back room. So to just quickly run through some of our programs, I mentioned our blog already, um, which is the program that's an outreach we do. Um, we have a program called Footsteps of the Cross, if any of you know Footsteps. Sounds like a few. Um, so this has been going on since 2008, right? Um, and we have a website for it where all of the tours are available online for if you wanted to do a self-guided tour. And then every May and September, we guide the tours for you. We do for the tours and we guide them. Um, this is, just shows the listing of the tours that we have. Um, and what the Vista tours do is really describe how plants, culture, and architecture intertwine on our city streets. Um, so you learn about the people, you learn about why they're important, why, and then you learn about their house and, and like, the art of their house or the architecture. Um, and the tours have different themes. So we have like a prairie style tour that just focuses really on the architecture. Um, and then we have neighborhood tours like downtown um, and then we have some of our um, neighborhood-centric, like the 10th and Cass um, National Register District, um, that kind of contextualize why that neighborhood existed at its time in history, right? Um, I just got it in September, um, and it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of people, which was really great. And I'll talk a little bit about Dirk of the Cross. Um, so, so you may have heard of this, you may have taken part in any part of this here. Um, it started with a walking tour in 2013. So the image you see there on the right uh, is one of our very first walking tours. We started in the corner of the second. And we got a lot of really great coverage by the TV news stations in the lacrosse Union, which helped publicize as well. So this is the first big story that hit the lacrosse Union. For the walking tours, and we, over the course of about 18 months, we ended up doing uh, 30 or 40 of these walking tours. Uh, over a thousand people came on the walking tours in the first 18 months as we did, as we did that, uh, which was wonderful. So we started that, uh, and then we put it on the Charlie, uh, so I explored the cross, uh, the cross area convention visitors bureau. Uh, every summer since then, really, so since 2014, we've been doing the Charlie tours of basically the walking tour with a couple of added stops that were a little farther out of the town. Um, we've been doing the trailer tour. So, and that's really geared towards tourists, but those that live here certainly can take advantage of it as well. So next time we look for those if you are interested, um, the, the dark across trailer tours and explore across. Um, anywhere from 10 to 15 times a summer, this tour will happen. Um, and we have got the plan to next summer. And then, the biggest thing we've ever done is the stage production, Dark and Cross show. So the, we started with that walking tour, about eight to ten stories downtown, and we said, let's put this on the stage. Uh, Nina Dorian got us a grant to do that. Uh, we did it at the Pump House, and it was very successful. We sold out every show. Uh, the first couple of shows were actually free as part of the grants, so we filled those up really fast and didn't have enough uh, shows planned for those that wanted to see it. So then after the grant ran out, about eight months later, we did it again, did the same show again. We sold out every show that we did uh, over the course of two weekends. So we thought that was a really big hit. It went well. So then, ever since then, we've been producing new content for the Dark Bar show. Every year, we have eight to ten new stories. We did it for five years, um, and basically, we got uh, all of the we, we were able to fundraise by doing sponsorship per show sponsorship, and businesses would sponsor a show performance. And that sponsorship was enough to cover all of our costs, which was fantastic. So every ticket sale was actually 100% profit towards the library, which is wonderful. So we, 
We had five years of a wonderful fundraising program that was also very entertaining. People loved it. People that don't remember coming to the library were able to come and take me to the library for a bit the beautiful conference. So we did that for five years. Uh, pandemic shut us down with that, and now the staff cuts that happened last summer the, to the library budget has kind of kept us from doing this again for a while. So we probably won't have a stage direction for a while. Again, if, if everything, we'll see. Um, we did take two of those, uh, one of which is available. You can get it from the library here. You can borrow a copy. You can buy a copy from us uh, if you would like to. Um, and another one that's still kind of in the works, uh, creating a product. The last thing that we did, I'm just going to briefly talk about that and jump into it, is in 2019, the editor of the Rouse Review, Russ Cunningham, they had been a sponsor of our show for a few years. Um, he said, hey, we'd like to work with you on this thing to get it out there even farther than the stage production did. So we started what's called Dark Rouse Stories, which is a video series, basically. Some people call it a podcast. It can be an audio-only podcast, but we like to promote video portions, the video episodes. They live on the Crash Stream website, uh, so you could, if you would like to go check them out, you can search up the Crash Stories on the Crash Stream website, or we now have a YouTube playlist, really easily accessible from our YouTube page, where you have all the episodes lined up. So if you can get yourself to YouTube, or if somebody can get you to YouTube, you can watch all 50 episodes of the Crash Stories if you would like. So what, what Jen's going to do here is we're going to give you a brief teaser of one particular episode. So we've got to change some audio here, so it's might take a three seconds. Jane's going to jump to a portion of the episode just for a bit of a teaser here. Once we get the audio. So this episode, as we're still waiting for the honor here, uh, George Brooks, uh, this is uh, episode number 31, George Brooks' Bloodhounds. Uh, he was instrumental and he trained a bunch of bloodhounds and for about 40 years he was very instrumental in crime solving the cross. He was, uh, you, you might see it depending on where we're going to start here, he was a soda jerk at Bodega, that was his day job. But his more important work was with his bloodhounds uh, tracking criminals basically in all kinds of different cases. Uh, and so this episode features several of those, uh, just kind of snippets of those various things that he was involved in. Say about 10 years at this point, and he says it's not too confined in 
inside all day serving sodas and ice cream. Said it. Said he needed something to get him outside. Said so what's the use of training hot dogs? You can't use them year round. So he started training hounds to hunt people, criminals, lost people, missing people, you name it. Even how okay a Japanese POW who was interned at Camp McCoy during the war. He saves lives. Of course, he's got the support of the police, the mayor, and the entire public on the cross. So, what am I supposed to do? Let him take off whenever he's got to go. Letter of a chance to switch over to audio again, but this goes on. Obviously, we would see more newspaper headlines of the different stories that he, uh, of the different cases he was involved in. Um, every episode always ends with about three or four minutes of additional kind of historic information. It's presented in the way that we did them on stage. Uh, so it's, it's presented with monologues of characters, fictional or otherwise, you know, we, we always are presenting facts, but sometimes we create a character to help relay those facts. Uh, and then the narrator, which is often me, um, is, was, was always kind of relaying the story by, by facts. So, Thank you. Okay. Uh, and so this here is from our website. Uh, very recently created because we just got through our 50th episode. And that's kind of where we're going to take a pause for now. But you can take a look at this website here. And Jenny created this and has given you kind of an episode guide. So if you are interested in a particular type of history in, in the cross, these might be of interest to you uh, here. So uh, some of them are darker than others. Obviously, the whole series is called Dark and Cross. And we always put a disclaimer on it that most of the time the content may not be suitable for those under like 13 or 14. Um, nothing crass, but sometimes the description of crime is, is a bit much. And a lot of this is coming right from the newspaper. It's a very vivid description, especially in the early part of the 20th century. So just bear that in mind that, that some of these are, are darker than others. But if you want to check it out, check those out there. Uh, the easiest place to view them is probably the Cross Pump Library YouTube page. Look for the Dark the Cross stories playlist. I think that's all I'm going to do for Dark the Cross now. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Jim here. So we do have one other thing that we can share with you. We do have 15 minutes, so maybe we'll jump into questions now. And then if we're out of questions, we have another five minute portion of the presentation. If we, if we need that. But any questions? Are you running out of room? Ah. Um, no, not necessarily. That's yeah, just for things, for storage. Yeah, that we do. Um, we have we have basements in this building. For those of you that are in the basement, it's pretty large. Uh, we do have a storage area down there. Um, we obviously are not just taking things just to take things. And often, when we get a, a particularly a large donation of the collection, we uh, assess that material and we don't keep everything. That's not what our capital does. We keep, we, we do assess material, uh, we do sampling, particularly if it's a large volume of the same kind of record that goes with business records a lot, and also city records for that matter. Do the sampling uh, so that we're not just filling shelves with things that are useful. And by doing that, it makes it much easier to review the collection as a picture to, rather than having to go through 100 boxes of things. We have sampled it up to maybe five boxes or you know, something like that of the really pertinent information that goes with that collection. So, in that sense, no, we're not necessarily running in the room. We also have just take everything that everybody gives us all the time. Are your archives always saying that you're a library or something? That's a good question. We are not. Uh, we never have been even before the pandemic. We never were fully open all the time the library was. Um, right now, Jenny has some pamphlets in the back there that you're welcome to grab with me on. has a for hours. We right now we're open 10 to noon and 1 to 3 weekdays for live reference. We encourage appointments at this time. So if you know you'd like to come in and take a look at something, please give us a call or email uh, to do so, to set up a time to come in. Uh, that's, that's the best way uh, that you can use your time if you come in the archives. And we're open Saturdays 1 to 5. Uh, again, for live reference, for phone calls, emails, uh, appointments at that time. So 10 to 2, 1 to 3 on weekdays. For the foreseeable future, they are, yes. 
the, the library potentially will be changing hours in 2022, the whole library as a whole, and we may follow suit with different hours at that time too, but at this point we don't worry about that. For the foreseeable future, yes, that is the hours. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll let you do that as part of the, the presentation. That's great. Would there be this parking ramp that is 
event. Scott touched on it before. This was part of the Harborview project. So they tore down all of these historic buildings. It's, this is the corner here, this is third and eighth. This is where the camera's at second and eighth. So they tore down these buildings as part of the Harborview project. Um, so that whole block now is the US Bank building and this parking ramp, right? This is another photograph of it during the demolition. Um, I'm gonna zoom out here. You can see the US Bank building being built on this part of the block. And these buildings haven't been torn down yet. And this is it in 1999. Um, so I, I like to get that because it just shows like that that's one um, intersection of downtown that we have a lot of photographs of because it was such an important intersection. The building that was the Crow um, had the Young, Man, the Young Men's Library Association in it, um, had the YMCA in it at some point. It had um, the, the Wisconsin Business University was in that building. Um, there were just many things happening at that street corner throughout the history of the cross. Do you have any questions now? Yes. When did the Cass Street Bridge get built? The 1930s, so it was done by 39, right? Um, 35, uh, I think it was completed in 37, maybe. And then the second bridge was completed in 2000. So for most of the history of that bridge area, there's actually just one bridge that was two lane traffic. Um, it was actually two lane traffic, and then in 2000, it was now the Cameron Street Bridge, basically to allow it to be two-lane, two-way bridges. They're separate bridges. But, so what we consider an iconic bridge now only has had its current footprint for about 20 years. So it was just that for 70 years. Uh, so, yeah. Any other questions? 